One man was an engineer. All through high school and college, I was designing all these computers. One man was a dreamer. It doesn't matter whether you like or dislike Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was making so many people miserable, and he said, this is You would have to be certifiable to bet against him. And together, they changed the world of computing, one home at a time. It really did launch the personal computer industry. No matter who you are, if you have a good idea and a little moxie, you can go out and change the world. This is the story behind the Apple II. From as early as grade school, Steve Wozniak has a fascination with technology. Back in elementary school, it was actually building incredible projects, starting out with little switches that play a game of tic-tac-toe, and then transistors that could do adding and subtracting. By high school, I actually discovered that I sort of knew logic, and I got some computer manuals, and I started putting the two together, and I started designing my own computers. So all through high school and college, I was designing all these computers. I didn't think I'd, it'd ever be a job. I just did it for fun. Wozniak goes to college at UC Berkeley, but ends up getting sidetracked in 1973. I took a year off to work, and within less than a year, I had a job at Hewlett Packard designing the greatest products in the world, the calculators, the first scientific calculators, and my career just kept going up and up and up, and I didn't get back to school. I mean, I was an engineer, so I didn't really need a degree. While working at Hewlett Packard, the young engineer is introduced to an old classmate. A friend down the street, Bill Fernandes, who worked in our group at Hewlett Packard, he had introduced me to this guy, Steve Jobs, that he knew, because Steve and I went to the same high school. And Bill said, you guys have something in common, you have to meet. So Steve and I met, and we hit it off. We started talking about electronics, where it might go, what some of the new devices were. We just shared such a connection there. Their shared interest leads them both to the Homebrew Computer Club in Menlo Park, California. Remember that phrase, anarchists unite? That was the Homebrew Computer Club. There were, must have been 250 people there, and you couldn't get two of them to agree on any other name, on any name, on anything. The people who showed up were professional programmers with no hardware experience who wanted to know about this new hardware machine that had just come out. Hardware people with no software experience who wanted to learn about software. It was a great match. I had drifted away from computers. I had lost track of things like microprocessors. I didn't really know they existed. And then a friend called up and said, there's this group starting up, a little meeting they're going to have, and you might want to go. I went to the club and discovered that everybody else was there for microprocessors and these little low-cost computers built on microprocessors. The club was uh, catalyzed by the appearance in the Bay Area of the very first model of the Altair, what we would now call personal computer. Right that night, late that night, maybe around midnight, I said, I'm back in business. Steve Wozniak always sat at the one seat there which had a, an electrical outlet nearby. So he would always have something set up there. Now there's another guy, Steve Jobs, who was there at that time a very silent person. He would be sort of lurking around, listening, and just absorbing lots and lots of information. My initial impressions of Steve Jobs was that he was young, hippie, arrogant. There were a lot of us in the world that had sort of wanted our own computer, but all we had was our company's computer, and we couldn't really do our things on it. If you had asked me about the future of computers before 1974, I would have told you that I didn't think it had a future at least not the way it was done in 1974 with mainframes and Fortran and punch cards. We grew up to five, about 550 members every meeting. And of course, right from the start, I sat down and said, I'm going to design a computer. I can finally afford one. I can buy a cheap microprocessor chip. I can buy some RAM from somebody in the club. I can attach my terminal that I designed at home, and I'll have a keyboard, a TV set, and a little computer. Wozniak teams with Steve Jobs to make his new idea a reality. Now, at first, it was just designed to show off at the club. I didn't have a company, so of course, I passed out the schematics. Everybody at the club could just take it and build their own. And then, like, a whole bunch of things that I designed in my life, Steve Jobs came along and said, hey, let's sell it. On April Fool's Day, 1976, Jobs and Wozniak create the Apple Computer Company and release their new PC as the Apple One. The computers are priced at exactly $666.66. The name Apple originally came from Newton's Apple. 
And as a matter of fact, Apple's first logo was Isaac Newton sitting under an apple tree, and the apple gave him inspiration. Then realized that was a little too esoteric for most people. So they made it more just apple the fruit. Steve wanted a company, wanted to change the world and get these products sold to people. The two Steves from Silicon Valley are just getting started. Little do they know that what they do next will surpass their wildest dreams. By 1976, Apple is up and running. The company's first computer, the Apple I, makes a small splash in the computing industry. Even in the earliest days, the Apple I, you know, you couldn't have made money if you were a real company and had expenses, you know, and salaries, but all we had was ourselves working at home for free. I had a job at Hewlett Packard, and Steve lived at home, and we could just sort of do just enough to get some sales going, and we got a bank account up to about $10,000, nothing real big. We sold about 150 of those Apple I computers, and we were just a little partnership, not a corporation. It wasn't the big product that was going to change the world. I saw the Apple I, and I thought it was a little bit unwieldy. It seemed like good first effort. Within a year, two competitors are released, the Tandy TRS-80 and the Commodore Pet. But Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak have a new product of their own, the Apple II. The Apple II was much more of an attempt at a, a commercial computer, something that could actually be sold and used by hobbyists, as opposed to the Apple I, which was really for hardcore geeks. Steve Wozniak, with his partner Steve Jobs, embarked together on this project. And it really benefited from both their talents. Steve started working on the Apple II around January of 1976. An amazing designer could design incredible things with almost no circuitry. I had this computer that was half as many chips as an Apple I, and it was doing color. At the time, everybody was designing with the 8080s. Woz chose the 6502 because 6502 was selling for $25, and he could afford that. And the 8080 was actually very expensive. He went to the uh, Westcon show, and they were handing out 6502s as a promotion. So he took one and said, hey, I'll design a computer around this. Wozniak envisions the Apple II as a computer that will revolutionize both the home PC market and the game industry. You need sound for games. So I put in a little speaker, and you need paddles. I came up with a very clever approach where one little chip worked four different paddles at once. I sat down, and I was going to program it on my microprocessor to play the game Breakout, which was one that I designed in hardware for Atari. And as I sat there and was about to start writing, I said, I wonder if it's possible to write a game in BASIC, the language that normal people can use. So I added the commands to put color on your TV set in the right places, and to put lines of color and blocks of color. And then I said, I'll make a little white ball. Then I got a little paddle. And all of a sudden, I had my game done, was breakout done basic, and it only took half an hour. We were going to move from games being hardware that take half a year to design to a year to becoming software programs that could be done in 10 days for a simple game. In the first West Coast Computer Fair in 1977, I saw the Apple II for the first time. The Apple II showed up, which says color. Oh, and it has a plastic molded case. No one else had that. It had a bus structure for cards, and it also had two-port memory. And it was being sold as fully assembled. The appearance of the Apple II was purely Steve Jobs, and that was so critically important, because now you had a computer that didn't look scary. Up until that time, every computer came in this military-looking square boxes. The Apple II came, it was sleek, it was sexy. That helped it to gain acceptance into a lot of people's homes. It was incredibly flexible. It had a lot of input-output slots inside the case. It had a very open architecture. It was very easy for people to program. Apple II had all that stuff in it. It had a power supply, had the connection for a monitor, which you buy. It had the keyboard, which was built in. How cool. All the stuff you needed to just turn it on and pow. Up on the screen, you were ready to run BASIC, which was the way people used computers back then. The first thing you'd see was a prompt into the BASIC computer language. 
You know, it was an all-in-one package, really easy to use for the time. To John and Wozniak's circle of friends, the Apple II is a marvel. But is the public ready to accept a computer into their homes? Marketing computers back in 1976, 1977 was a virgin territory. To most people, it was a ridiculous thing. What would you possibly have a need for a computer sitting on your desk? <laughs> The first Apple IIs are shipped out in June 1977. The slick new computers sell for $1,298 each. That same year, Apple creates a new logo and moves out of Steve Jobs' garage into a real office in Silicon Valley. Sales of the Apple II aren't bad, but two new features will skyrocket demand for the new system. The first is the introduction of an affordable disk drive. Well, cassette loading programs really suck. That, you know, was the technology that was much cheaper than disk drives at that point. Uh, disk drives were a pretty pricey item. If you put in the tape and you had to rewind it and then play it while it read in all the data serially, and it took a really long time to do that. So it was very, very slow. Quite often you get tape errors and you'd have to start the load all over again. When we first started Apple in the office in January of 77, Woz would tell me about these ideas he had for doing a disk drive. He'd had the idea for years before, making it a simple state machine. He started bringing it up, and by God, it worked. It was incredible. No one could believe that the disk was just controlled by these six little chips. Up to that time, everything had been like 40 or 50 chips. So we were going to be able to offer the disk at a price that no one had ever seen before. Not only was he able to make a cheaper disk drive from a competitive standpoint, but he was actually able to put about 30% more data on the disk because of a technique that he invented for storing the data on the disk. And he did all of that work in his head. The introduction of the disk, I think, is the single largest event that made Apple a real company. It allowed us to actually mass produce media. It gave the computer a level of storage that was hard to uh, believe in those days, and especially for a machine that was priced as inexpensively as it was. At that point, Apple began pulling ahead of all of its competitors. The Apple Disk II is released in July 1978. The drive cost only $140 to make, but retails for $595. Still, it's one of the most affordable disk drives of its time. There were two things that accelerated the sale of the Apple II. One was the floppy drive, and the other was a program called VisiCalc. When the Apple II was first introduced, there was like almost no software for it. Then as time went on, a lot of hobbyists who just loved writing software because they could, started writing software. The first major program for the Apple II that really burned like wildfire was VisiCalc from Dan Bricklin. That was an amazing advance. No one had ever seen anything like it. Just a brilliant concept and executed very well. VisiCalc put Apple on the map not just as a personal computer, but as a business computer. For a period of about a year, a year and a half, it was the only spreadsheet. Nearly everyone today who's in business uses a spreadsheet. But try and think about the time before there was a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets existed. Oh, yeah, they existed. It was a piece of accounting paper, a pencil, and a very large eraser, because you had to do it all by hand. Accountants, finance people wanted that program. They wanted that capability, and they bought it. And they brought it into work, and that's how the first computers ended up in the workplace. The combination of the Disk 2 drive and VisiCalc rocketed the Apple II into the mainstream market. The company went from garage to offices, and then they expanded out of that building, and then they expanded again, and the next thing I knew, they had purchased their own corporate headquarters. You know, I mean, it's bang, bang, bang. Apple was so successful so rapidly, we had so many good people covering the bases, from marketing to business, operations, engineering, and Steve himself basically covering the globe, making sure everything was being attended to that needed attending to. The Apple II was a pivotal event. It was the first financially successful personal computer. This was the first computer to show the business world that there was actually an industry there. And we were making money hand over fist wildly successful and everybody was having a great time. 
We're talking about Apple going from zero to $2 billion in what, five years? And that was just continuous growth. We went from practically no computers to everybody having a computer. Right, if you didn't have a computer, you probably used one at work. The Apple II is riding high, both in the workplace and at home. But the company isn't unchallenged. There's always been a certain amount of religious wars between different flavors of computers. At the time, it was really Apple users, Commodore PET users, and the TR-80 users were the three big kind of groups. And all those computers were, of course, completely incompatible. As more competitors up the ante, the Apple II faces rough waters, and its ultimate undoing will come from the most unlikely place. In 1980, there are close to 300,000 Apple II users. The company now employs more than 1,000 people, and an improved Apple II Plus is on store shelves. Once again, the young company looks ahead to the future. Well, the Apple went through a whole series of Apple IIs. There was the Apple II, there was the Apple IIe, there was the Apple IIc, which was the smaller, white-boxed Apple. In each case, they were repackaging essentially the same machine to try to make it more friendly to the consumers in one way or another. Apple was very good at marketing, and still some of the slickest software, especially like a business application, was on the Apple. But not all the new ideas are good ones. The company started hiring a bunch of MBAs who came in and said, wow, really cute company you built here. We'll show you how to do it right. A consequence, a example of what they produced was the Apple III. It was not a brilliant engineer working through design. It was not even a brilliant idea. The Apple III was designed more as a direct competitor to the IBM PC. The Apple III was deliberately positioned to be a business machine. And a lot of people thought that was really a, a great design and something that really could stand toe to toe with the IBM PC. But it really wasn't as powerful as the IBM. The very first units they had had a flaw in them. They had to recall them. And the thing got off to a really bad start. It was so disappointing that the company could produce something so bad. And that was a, you know, a major failing for them. Never really recovered from that. Steve Jobs was still with the company when Apple III came out, and he hated it. But despite Apple's failures, the Apple II still manages to perform. The Apple line lasted a really long time because it had a huge install base of software, which was built up really in the very early 80s. And that really carried it a really long way. However, it's Apple that does what none of their competitors could do. Break it up. Bring an end to the Apple II. After the Apple III came out, uh, a lot of people realized, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should still be promoting the Apple II. So they started promoting the Apple II. But then the MBAs and other large corporate citizens said, well, let's build a better computer, and we'll call it Lisa. Steve Jobs saw the Lisa, and he said, well, this is not going to work. This is that was Steve's favorite saying. Basically, the board and management said, stay away from Lisa. You're basically banned from over there. Steve said, can I go take over this uh, Macintosh project instead? And they said, well, sure, whatever. And so Steve went over and took over the Macintosh group and said, we're going to do things differently here. It's going to be an all-in-one box. It is going to be sleek and sexy. And so that's how the Macintosh project really took off. One of the bad things that Jobs did when we introduced the Mac is he wanted the Macintosh to succeed, and he wanted everything else to fail. So he did everything he could to basically eliminate Apple II sales. But despite all of that, the Apple II continued to generate an enormous amount of money for, for several years until the Macintosh finally did catch on. Woz's original invention was just so hard to beat. Today, the impact of the Apple II and its creators is still felt in the world of computing. But you find Macintosh users, and they love their machine. Apple was so successful so rapidly, and there are people just enjoying what they're doing and happy, and they're smiling. I think the Apple II will be remembered as the first computer that was attractive and was all-in-one. It really did launch the personal computer industry. Like, Key figures like Wozniak and Steve Jobs were just iconic to us. They were the people that we looked up to to say, oh, you know, no matter who you are, you know, if you have a good idea and a little moxie, 
you know, you can go out and change the world. It doesn't matter whether you like or dislike Steve Jobs. You would have to be certifiable to bet against him. He has done things that no one else has ever done. He has had his failures, but his successes are spectacular. You know what? Everything that ever happened in Apple, the jokes, the friends I had, the people that worked there, how they fought, how we talked, just the best memories of my life. iPhone, 1.2 megapixel camera and holds 5,000 MP3s. Wow, that's that's really impressive. Mm. Hold on a second, sorry. Hello? Yeah, hey, I'm in the middle of lunch. Uh, can I call you back? All right, cool, thanks. So that's a lot of MP3s. Yeah. Mm. See the best, greatest, biggest, shiniest, coolest, and blinkiest new stuff coming next year when the screensavers goes live at the Consumer Electronics Show. Coming up next. Hold on, let me let me put you on speakerphone. <laughs>